you notice that when you read the headlines in the paper, or not too many of us read it in the paper, on your news source, whatever feed you're looking at, that sometimes, and most of the time, it's kind of bad news, right? Like I just grabbed the News Tribune here. They're talking about an arrest warrant for a woman to, in Tacoma. They're talking about the Ukrainian war. Uh, then we're talking more about the, the civilian suffering. I mean, there's just a lot of bad news. And yet, God's word is full of so much good news. Somebody say good news. What would be in the headlines of heaven if God was writing the news for us? Now, I picked this up this weekend. I was up at our parent church up in Venture. Shout out, Venture. We are here because we have a great parent church that supports us. And they literally have the same theme going on as we do. And we didn't copy them. We just didn't know what they were doing. And they didn't know what we were doing. But, hey, great minds think alike. Uh, But we need some good news in our lives. Uh, And... Last week, we talked about the headlines being that we are not alone. Remember that? That that no matter what messy situations we find ourselves, no matter what type of trouble we find ourselves, Jesus meets us in the mess. Aren't you thankful for a God who meets you in the mess? Uh, And this week, we have a new headline. But I want to share this story from the history books. Now, If you went to school, which I hope you did, you you learned a few things about World War II, right? We learned that in World War II, it was the Nazi regime that was really trying to take over the world. That was the horrific genocide of the Jewish people. And one of the most miraculous stories during World War II is now known as the miracle of Dunkirk. You might have watched the movie a few years ago. It was fascinating. But Dunkirk was this small little town on the coast of France, and it was occupied by the Allies who were fighting against the Nazis. So the good guys were there in Dunkirk. And in 1940, there were over 400,000 Allies, okay? Almost a half a million uh, Allies were in Dunkirk, and they found themselves in a tough situation because the North Sea was too shallow for the Navy ships to get in, and the Germans were closing in on them. So they were blocked. They couldn't get away by water, and they couldn't go by land because the Nazis were closing in on them. And without a plan, over 400 soldiers would likely fall into enemy hands or at least be d- face death or being POWs. What were they going to do? It was Winston Churchill that decided to take action in an unexpected move of honest desperation. He said this. He called on the everyday civilians in Britain, and he said, I want anybody and everybody who has a boat to get out there and take your boat over to Dunkirk and rescue the soldiers who are stuck. They called it Operation Dynamo. Doesn't that sound like something from like a James Bond movie, Mitch, right? It sounds like dun, 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 dun. But here's the reality. It was almost laughable at the time. They they expected to maybe, maybe rescue a fraction of the troops. Nobody thought it was going to work because, let's be honest, civilians were getting involved. These weren't trained people. And they thought, well, maybe we can help some of them. But the Brits were determined. And they sent out over 850 boats over to Dunkirk. And the crazy plan succeeded in rescuing 338,000 soldiers. Sometimes impossible situation takes a person with a plan. You ever get in one of those situations where you need somebody with a plan? I remember I was around 12 years old and I was where I was doing something I wasn't supposed to do. Anybody else do stuff you weren't supposed to do when you were 12 years old? Uh, We were never allowed down by this river and this creek, and it was flood stage, and I fell in, and good thing, and I was going under. I I remember looking up, you know, in the movies, you'd look up, and you can, like, see, and I thought, this is it. This is how I'm going. Jesus, here I come. And a good thing my cousin Cherry was there, and she had a plan, and her plan was to ask my friend Jeffrey to jump in after me, and thank God he did, and I'm here to tell the story today. Um, But us humans, we're good at getting ourselves into situations where we need help, right? Um, 
we like to think of ourselves as independent and self self-sufficient, but really we get ourselves into trouble. Isaiah puts it like this, Isaiah 53, 6. He says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've all left God's paths to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid on him the sins of it all. Notice the emphasis of all. All of us have messed up. All of us have gotten ourselves into desperate situations. And sometimes we have to stop and ask, how's this working for us? Look around at the world. How's it working for us? You know, when we look at problems, we often want a person with a plan to fix it. It happens every election year, right? And here we go again. Buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. Uh, We won't talk about that. We'll do some more praying. But we often look to politicians and city officials and educational systems and economic Uh, development because we know it's going to take a plan to fix things, right? That's just common sense. But if we were reading the newspaper back in the day of Jesus, I believe one of the headlines would have said this, God has a plan. God has a plan. And just like the battle at Dunkirk, uh, it might be unexpected. It might be kind of out of the box. It might be kind of crazy, but it just might work. It just might work. I want to welcome to the table this morning, Brandon and Satricia. Give them a hand. So why do we need a plan? Why, why, actually, why do we need to rely on God's plan instead of our own? Because, you know, I've had some plans in my life, and they all haven't worked out the way I wanted them to. Yeah. But why is it important to go for God's plan and not always just my plan? Because he's our creator. So he created us and he knows how we operate and function at our best. And so his plan is going to always sharpen us, make us better. It's going to have us operating the smoothest um, no matter what happens. That's good. That is good. Yeah. I mean, if I can get something off my chest this morning, I'm kind of a control freak. I don't know about you. Yes. I like to have my own plan, um, but it's kind of like... It's a diff- we're playing on different fields, right? I, my mom does puzzles all the time. I'm not a puzzle person, but sometimes I'll sit down, and there's a piece that looks like it could fit, so I'm trying to jam it into the... <laughs> she's like, that piece isn't going to go there because she's got the box in her hand. She's got the picture, and um, that's kind of how it is with God, yeah. right? God's yeah. got the whole picture. <laughs> we're yeah. trying to shove pieces where they don't belong. Yeah. Um, a couple of characteristics of God. He's, he's all-powerful. That's called right. omnipotence, yeah. but he's also omni omniscient right Right. omniscient that keyword of omni and that means he's all-knowing so he knows everything so it's a little bit ignorant to say well I know better you know my plan when we have someone who knows everything and he's got a plan so I'd much rather listen to him than me yeah and I love what Isaiah says because Isaiah points out that God's plans and his ways are higher than mine so I can come up with a plan yeah Yeah. but uh, Isaiah says this he says For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We're going to go back and look at the prophet Isaiah this morning, and we're going to talk about a few ways that he outlines God's rescue plan for us. And I love it that we're coming up on Easter, which is the celebration that God's plan actually worked, right? It was kind of like... Dunkirk, right, where it was like, okay, this is kind of a crazy plan. Uh, if I was God, I'm not quite sure I would have done it that way, right? Yeah. Can, can we just be honest and say, yeah, I'm not sure if I would have done it that way, but it's a crazy plan that works. So Brandis, Brandon, kick us off and tell us what kind of a plan yeah. that w- did we start with. Anyone here like religious planners, like you've got a actual planner book where you're like, you know, June 17th, I'll be here doing this. Anyone here? Yeah. Nobody? Okay. Guilty as charged. Maybe more my speed. Sometimes I like just kind of fly by the seat of my pants and not make yeah. a plan. But many times we make plans when we need plans. And that kind of has been yeah. me in, in conditions where it's right. like, all right, I have to figure this out. I need a plan. We make plans for emergencies. Mm-hmm. We go on vacations. We, you know, make travel plans. Yep. We book our flights, our hotels. We know who's going to pick us up and drop us off and that sort of thing. Hopefully people yeah. are planning for retirements. I know yes. that's a scary thing, yeah. but Ooh. retirement, make plans for that. Plans often follow needs in our life. Um, yeah. Even if we're not really planners, yeah. we make plans when we have needs. Yeah, and God knew good. that we had a problem that we couldn't fix ourselves. Yeah. Sin was that problem. Yeah. Like in Genesis, we sinned, and we needed help escaping that sin. So it would require a plan. And like you said, it might not have been a plan 
right. that you would come up I, with. Not my plan. But, but yeah. we needed a plan. Um, so the prophet Isaiah re- re- reveals the urgencies of God's plan. Mm. In Isaiah 51, uh, verse 4, it says, Pay attention to me, my people, and listen to me, my nation. Mm. For a law will go out from me, and my justice will become a light to the nations, mm. and I will bring it about quickly. Mm. So Isaiah, to give you a little bit of a context, I went to school to, <laughs> got a biblical degree uh, from a yeah. Bible college. Come on, somebody. So uh, we're going to go a little bit nerdy today. So <laughs> Isaiah is a prophetic book. Isaiah is a prophet, and he's writing to primarily a Jewish people who are captives in Babylon. So yeah. really his message is a message of comfort and encouragement yeah. to this kind of worn out people that, mm-hmm. you know, are kind of hopeless and in distress mm-hmm. and questioning whether God yeah. sees them or not. But that same comfort is available to us. You know, it's, it's available to all of God's people who uh, who have set themselves apart for God. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says even when God's people are facing distress and yeah. sorrow yeah. and contempt, that God's yeah. plan is still alive. That's good. I want you to notice this. The prophet says, that God wants to bring his justice and a light to the nations quickly. Yeah. Somebody say quickly. 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 God's plan yeah. responded with urgency. That's good. <laughs> I don't know about That's you, good. but when I need help, yeah. I like it to happen fast. Yes. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just last week, I wasn't here. I was actually flying back from California. And when I landed in SeaTac, first of all, I'm just going to take on a soapbox here. SeaTac, I don't know who designed SeaTac <laughs> if it was a bunch of rats, but it's just like, it's a nightmare every time I go there. Um, but we landed at SeaTac, and somebody, some poor person, just left their baggage oh, at no. the um, arrivals or whatever, or the departures. And they, you know, out of abundance of caution, they shut down the top right. part of the airport because they thought yeah. it was, you know, something suspicious. So everyone right. who's come into the airport, to be dropped off is going at the bottom level. Everyone who's getting off planes trying to catch a ride is at the bottom. So it was just a zoo. So I'm landing. I landed from California. So welcome home to Washington. It's rainy. It's windy. <laughs> there's cars honking and people screaming and people running around. And my ride is stuck in traffic like 30 minutes away from me. And I've got, you know, backpack on. I've got a bunch of bags. And it's cold outside. I wanted them to be there faster. I would like a little bit more urgency, right. but, you know, just because of circumstances, I didn't have that, you know, so I like urgency. We like help to come quickly. Yeah. And I love that it, in here, it says that God's plan is responding with urgency. It's quick. God isn't up in heaven, you know, saying, well, I've got a few other projects right now. Like, let me, I'll get to you guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's, he's active. He's alive right now. And I think that's just such good news. You know, that's yeah. our, that's our title, yeah. but that's good news that he's not just sitting around doing good. other things. He hasn't forgotten about us, but that's he's good. active and urgent. His timing might not be our timing, right. but, um, with yeah. a sense of urgency, God's bringing about salvation. So table team, what types of situations motivate you to, to make plans? Are you planners? Yeah, I'm a planner. Guilty. I'm absolutely not. You're not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I would say, Satrice, I don't know about you, but when the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change, yes. yeah. that's usually when I'm, I do something different. Yeah. Uh, and I have a high tolerance. I think all of us have a high tolerance for pain. We There's always something. Think of something in your life that you don't like, but you're tolerating it. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of putting up with it. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe there's tension in a relationship. Maybe it's just something that you know needs to change. But yeah. but at some point, if you get to that place where you're like, you know what? I cannot handle this anymore. Mm-hmm. God, there has to be a change. There, yeah. Then that urgency steps in. Yeah, what about that's you? True. Um, because I'm not a planner, <laughs> God has blessed me with the ability to think quick on my toes. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, I rely on that a lot. And sometimes God's like, even though your plan is good and your plan can get it done, it's not my plan. Yeah. Mm. And so a lot of times I have to let go of what I plan to do or what I think is the quickest, mm. best way and say, okay, what is your plan? So God's plan versus my my good plan. Yeah, that's really that's good. So good. God plan or good plan. Yeah. yeah. That one O makes all the difference. Yes. <laughs> that's so true. With that, when we talk about our plans, God plans, tell us a little bit more about what we can kind of glean from God's plans. Yeah. Yeah. So part of God's plan for salvation included um, a selfish act of love. Yeah. Um, in Isaiah yeah. 53, 45, or 53, 4 through 5, it says, Surely he took on our infirmities and carried our mm. sorrows. Mm. Yet we considered him stricken by God, mm. struck down and afflicted. Yeah. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. That's good. When I, I've always heard this scripture. It's kind of like a popular scripture, you know, in church. But when I saw this, and it says the punishment that brought us peace right. was upon was upon him. Mm. I was like, wow. So he was punished or he was tortured or he suffered so that I can have peace. Mm. And I can have peace because mm. one, I'm forgiven no matter yeah. what I've done. Yeah. Two, I, I can have peace because of his promises for me. And if I stand on his promises, I know that no matter what comes my way, that That's God good. is for me, that he loves me, that yeah. he died so that so I can good. have a good ending and mm-hmm. that this isn't the end. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so um, God's plan shows us uncondition- God's unconditional love, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, because he suffered and he endured all of that so we could have yeah. peace. It showed how much he loved us. So yeah. I'm going to ask you guys a question. What, what does the suffering of Jesus reveal about his love for us? Mm. Wow. That's good. There's just, I think there's so much there, you know, and right. we're going into Easter and we're going to talk a lot more about, you know, yeah. Jesus's road to the cross, but, um, yeah. which is crazy. It's a crazy, I know we talk about it every year, but there's still details in there that's like, yeah. that is unimaginable. But, yeah. but what I said, you know, is really that it shows that God's love is really limitless. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that, you know, Jesus, here he is, he's on the cross. This is some of his last words in Matthew, um, 27, 46, he says, um, he cries out to God. He's on the cross, mm-hmm. and he cries out, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And to me, you know, I read that verse, and it shows that he gets it. You know, yeah. he, the Son of God, God incarnate in human form on earth, mm. knows what it feels like to be abandoned, yeah. Yeah. know what it feels like to think that God has forgotten about yeah. him. Right. So, you know, I don't know if you've gone through hard things, and you've had friends come to you and say, oh, yeah. I've, yeah, I, can, I can relate to you. I can mm-hmm. empathize. Yeah. It's like that only goes so far, but with mm-hmm. Jesus... Like it goes that it goes that yeah. distance, right? Yeah. He knows what it feels yeah. like. So in every situation, mm. in every bit of hopelessness, yeah. God can empathize with us. That's just really what it speaks to me, and it's really powerful. Wow. Well, you know, for me, I I often question the motives of of people. Like, mm-hmm. if do you really, you know, you say you love me, do you really love me? Are you yeah. a friend? Yeah. Are you really a friend? You know, mm-hmm. my poor husband, and I I asked him I asked him for permission to share this story. But when we were first dating. Um, I remember the first time he told me he loved me. And I remember looking at him saying, how can you love me? You, we, don't even, we haven't even been dating that long, you know, because I was just skeptical. I'm like, yeah, yeah, really, you know, poor guy. But he has spent the last 26 years proving it, Come right? On. He has been pro- faithful go, and proved that he loves me. But in the same way, you know, there's not too many people that I would die for, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I'd take a bullet for my kids, yeah. right? I think all of us would say that. I, I'd, I'd take a bullet for my husband. Um, but there's not too many people I would, I would do that level of sure. suffering for. Yeah. So to me, it's like Jesus proved it. He yeah. doesn't just say, I love you. Like, he showed it. Yeah. He showed that unconditional yeah. love. Absolutely. Yeah. So even when we, we sh- see his unconditional love, I think a lot of times we don't recognize that they didn't take his life, that he gave it up willingly. Right. Oh, yeah. And right. so when I look at Matthew 26, yeah. 44, so he left them and went away and prayed the same prayer for the third time. Mm-hmm. And so the prayer was in Matthew 26, 42, it says, my father, if there is not a way that you can deliver me from this suffering, then your will must be done. Wow. When I saw this, it's like it shows Jesus's human side right? Right? because it wasn't like he was just supernatural and he's like, I'm going to do this. Nobody uh, wants to go. suffer. No, he was Nobody stressing. wants yeah. to suffer. <laughs> and it says he went three times and prayed the same prayer yep. three times. Wow. Yeah. And even in Luke 22, 44, yeah. it says he, he travailed in prayer so mm. much that he sweat blood. Yeah. Yeah. So he had to even yeah. make his will line mm. up with the plan that God mm. had for us so that we can receive wow. the peace that he, he died for. Wow. And so when I saw that, I'm like, it's bigger than just like, him going to the cross, he died. Mm -hmm. No, he suffered. Like he Mm -hmm. suffered even in his flesh, not my will, but your will, God. When I I never noticed the part that he prayed the same prayer three times before. I always thought he just prayed that and it was done. (laughs) You know, and sometimes we pray something and we expect it to happen like that. Like I prayed it once. Okay. My faith is high. No, you might have to go back and pray that same prayer 15 times. Right. You might have to do it every minute of every day until your will lines up with the plans of God for your life yeah and so um when I when I think about Jesus and his unconditional love I'm thankful that I could have peace 
and that I'm forgiven. I can have peace that there's a purpose Mm -hmm. and there's a plan for my life. And I can have peace that he loves me despite me. And I can have peace that even in my flesh, I can line it up with with the will that God, with the plan that God has for my life. If I just continue to to stand in faith, if I just continue to believe what God said and believe what his word said and fight through that. I'm praying that I never, you know, get to the point where I sweat (laughs) blood. But I'm thankful that, you know, I have the opportunity to stand on his word and receive his unconditional love. So what else would you say about God's plan? You know, one of the core desires all of us have as humans is freedom, right? I mean, when we read the Declaration of Independence, uh, it says we want to preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Um, Yeah, that is a good movie, right? Uh, Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I think that's what's so hard about even watching the news about the Ukrainian war because we're watching in real time Mm. people's freedom being stripped away from them and how how devastating uh, it is. But just like Operation Dynamo, you know, came to rescue those soldiers back in World War II from an enemy, uh, we have a very real enemy. Yeah. You know, we don't like to talk about this too much, right? Yeah. Uh, especially in church, which I don't know why, but we have a real enemy. If we think about this, if we believe God is real, then we have to believe that there is a Satan, yeah. right? And, and he was an angel, right? And the Bible says, you know, he rebelled and he was kicked out of heaven. Um, but Jesus even teaches us about our enemy. How do you know? How, how many know you want to kind of know what your enemy's up to, right? But Jesus in John 10.10 10 says this. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But yeah. I have come that they might have life yeah, and yeah. have it to the full. What a contrast, right? Yes, yeah. our, our enemy wants to destroy us, but God wants to deliver us. Yes right? Such a, such a profound difference. And when we're forgiven, we are free from that power of sin that none of us can avoid because we have all, we've all sinned, right? Uh, and and so whatever I'm allowing to have control over me is giving that power. I'm giving power to it. Mm -hmm. I I love what Isaiah says in 55, six through seven. He says, seek the Lord while you can find him, call on him, while he is near, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to God, to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Somebody say generously. Generously. You know, I, I like that he added that. He didn't just say he'll forgive. He said he'll forgive generously because I think God knew I would be messing up generously, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I would need some generous forgiveness. Yeah. Um, but the simplicity of the gospel is this. God has a plan. Yeah. He responded with urgency. It's not always the time that we want, yeah. but he proved it. He proved his unconditional love by suffering. Yeah. And even though he didn't want to, he was like, I'll do it. You know, God, if there's no other way, I'll, I'll be the sacrifice. But then it, it resulted in unexpected freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Unexpected freedom. But here's the thing about plans that I want us to grab and take home with us. And I want, I want you to chew on this this week. The thing about plans is they only work if they're followed, right? Yeah. Think about this. Your last workout plan that you were going to get in shape, yeah. did it work? Or did it not? I see a lot of heads shaking back and forth. <laughs> if it worked, awesome. It worked because you followed the plan, right? And if it didn't work, why didn't it work? You didn't follow the plan, right? Uh, our plans are only good as our willingness to follow them. When I make a plan for our family, if the, if the family doesn't follow the plan, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, when Winston Churchill said, hey, I got a plan. We're all going to get in our boats, and we're all going to go over to Dunkirk, and we're going to rescue as many soldiers. Everybody could have said, yay, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But they had to follow the plan. They had to get in the boat. They had to gas up the boat. They had to go and risk their lives because there were aerial attacks. Mm -hmm. They had to risk their lives, and not everybody made it, right? But God has this plan to offer us freedom, but we have to follow it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling convicted in my own heart lately, just my propensity to buck against God's plans. Like, I just want to, I would rather do it my way, yeah. God, yeah. right? I remember when my kids were little and my daughter 
would want to put her shoes on, and she's like, I'll do it myself. But she, she couldn't do it herself. She needed help, yeah. right? And so I would be like, no, let mommy help you until you're ready. Then you can do it yourself. I feel like we're like that with God, aren't we? God, I can do it myself. Table team, thank you for sharing the good news. God has a plan. 